Hey, I'm Pastor Andrew Ebanks, lead pastor at the Agape Family Worship Center. We pray this message and resource will stir up your affections for Jesus and encourage you in your calling. Use this resource in conjunction with you belonging to a local church that is helping to shape and shepherd you in Jesus Christ. If these resources bless you, would you consider giving back to us here at Agape? You can visit us at agapekman.ky slash giving to see how you can do that. Again, we pray this blesses, encourages, and grows you in your love for Jesus Christ. this morning amen that was a little enthusiastic we'll see if you keep that enthusiasm as we move through the message this morning <laughs> praise the Lord it is uh, it's good to be able to share his word with you uh, so today we are continuing in message number three in our series save the date where we've just been talking about relationships we've been talking about dating we've been talking about marriage we've been talking about being single we've been talking about a, a lot of different things and uh, and as we have been navigating this, uh, I know that, that some of these messages are going to just be challenging for us. And so uh, I want to start off this morning with a little bit of statistics. And, uh, and statistically speaking, most of us in life will get married at some point. But statistically speaking, most of us or many of those marriages will not make it based on the statistics of today. Why? Because... The statistics are extremely high that, that for a good portion of people, and depending on how you, it's difficult to say 50% of all marriages fail, and one of the reasons why is because it depends on what you're looking at. But what we know is, is that the failure rate for many marriages today are extremely high. And statistically speaking, of those that don't make it, of those marriages that, that don't make it, that they look back and they can see that along the way that there were a lot of warning signs that it wasn't going to make it. As a matter of fact, we have a whole phrase for it. We say that hindsight is 2020, meaning that when I look back and I see the things that were going on before, if I had paid attention to those things, I would have had a much clearer vision of my life and a much clearer vision of where we're going. Because the reality is, is that when you're dating and you want to be in love and, and, and you want to, you know, you want all the songs on the radio to make sense and you're, you're listening to the radio and you're just like, oh, this song makes me think about them. I feel so in love. Like, this must be a sign that they're the one. And, and we just, we get so excited about it. And, and we just, everything just seems right in the world, even when things don't seem right. And our mind says to us, two things happen. Our mind says to us, pay attention to these things. That you see something happen that doesn't seem right, and your mind says, pay attention to that. But your heart instead goes, yeah, but love is all we need, and we can make it work. Let me just tell you, you need more than love to make a marriage work. You need more than love to make a marriage work. And so... We have this whole thing where our mind screams at us, pay attention to this, look out for this. There's, there's warning signs. As a matter of fact, we, even, we have a, a, another phrase for this that we like to call them red flags. And we look around and we see the relationships that we're in, whether it's dating relationships or work relationships or whatever, and we see those red flags go up and we start seeing those warning signs that are telling us, hey, something isn't quite right here. And so the title of my message today is Five Signs That You're Dating the Wrong Person. And uh, let me just say that we're going to start with prayer because we need it this morning. <laughs> so, Father God, I just thank you for this message right now. I pray that you would speak to our hearts, that, Father God, you would challenge us, that even though, Lord, that sometimes that it can be difficult to look at your word and see the things that you are saying to us, that, Lord, I pray this morning that we would receive it with an open heart and an open spirit. 
And then, Father God, that you would transform our relationships because of the things that you want to do in us and through us for the glory and honor of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you got to say amen with me this morning because you're going to need it. Trust me. So say amen. (laughs) Well, I'm going to be honest with you. Some of the things we're going to talk about this morning are going to, for some of us, we're going to go, this is really extreme. Like, Pastor, where are we, we going with this? But I want to start, first of all, with the Word of God. When we, when we look at the Word of God in Proverbs chapter 27, there is a scripture there that is going to give us a contrast of two different types of people. And it talks about the sensible and the unthinking or the unwise And it says that each of these two groups of people do two things. Proverbs 27, 12. Let's read it together. Good News Translation says this. Sensible people will see trouble coming and avoid it. But an unthinking or an unwise person will walk right into it and regret it later. And so here it is, it starts off, and and Proverbs is telling us here in this verse, it says that that, that you've got two types of people, and those two types of people are going to respond in two ways. And let's just kind of pull this up so that we can can make clear what these two things are. So we've got the sensible and the unthinking, and what do these two groups do? The sensible sees trouble coming and avoids it. It does... So it does what? It sees trouble coming and avoids it. Would you say that with me? It sees trouble coming and avoids it. What does the unthinking person do? Walks into trouble and regrets it later. Let's say that. Walks into trouble and regrets it later. And here's the thing is that we've all done this. So we can't just simply look around and go, well, yeah, they always make foolish decisions. No, no. We've all been that unthinking, unwise person at some point where we've all done something. There's there's hopefully been a time where we've been the sensible one who we we see trouble coming and we we avoid it. But, But if you are paying attention to what Proverbs is saying to you, it's saying that some of us will see red flags everywhere. And we will just simply ignore them and we will walk right into something that we shouldn't. And some of us have actually been there in relationships. Some of us have been in some really tough spots where this morning that you're going to be sitting there because of what you have been through, what you have walked through, the experiences that you've had. And as you listen to this message this morning, you're going to be nudging somebody and you're going to be telling them, "You, you should really be listening to this message right now. Because you know the pain and the hurt that comes along with ignoring the red flags that are popping up, the warning signs that are there. And so like I said, this morning's message is going to be a little extreme for some of us. It's going to be a little bit weird to talk about if I'm being quite honest with you. And the reason for that is because I am talking this morning to those of us who are wanting to follow Jesus faithfully. If you are wanting to follow Jesus faithfully, this message is for you. If, you're not, if, if that's not you, we're still happy you're here this morning. We're still glad that you're here. This is a, a great place to be as you uh, explore what your next steps are in, in, in your spiritual journey and in your faith as you follow Jesus and you're trying to figure that out. We're so happy you're here. But if you're not committed to following Jesus, what I'm going to talk about this morning is going to be and seem really, really strange and really, really weird and odd and different to you. And I want to acknowledge that. And the reason why I want to acknowledge that is is because while I'm all for it today and it's going to be different and it might be a little weird, that's okay because what normal is in our world today is broken hearts and broken lives and broken relationships and we don't want that. That's not what we're here for. That's not what what God really intended for any of us. And so I don't want you to have regrets because you say, well, well, pastor never told me. Pastor never talked about that. Pastor never had anything to say in relation to this. And I want to actually start uh, uh, with mentioning this to you today because it's important to realize that we're going to talk about some stuff that you might hear this and you might go, 
Wow, pastor, that's, that's a bit extreme, don't you think? That's okay. So we're going to talk this morning about five signs you're dating the wrong person. And the first sign that you are dating the wrong person is when the person that you're dating is not consistently pursuing Jesus. That's the first sign that you're dating the wrong person. Now, listen, nobody is perfect. And we're all going to, at some point in time, mess up. As a matter of fact, just a show of hands, how many of us already messed up this morning? <laughs> Several of us. Thank you for your honesty. Me too. Me too. None of us are perfect. We have all messed up. The Bible says that we have all sinned and fallen short. And there will be times in your life where in your pursuit of Jesus that, that maybe there's just a few things that aren't clicking the way that they're supposed to click. They're, 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 you're not firing on all cylinders the way that you hope to do. But when we are dating someone who is not consistently pursuing Jesus, this should be a red flag for us. As a matter of fact, and this is uh, very popular in places like Cayman, the U.S., and in other parts of the world where, where we have what we recognize as being cultural Christians. Meaning, what that means is that you may be dating someone who identifies themselves as a Christian, but it's more cultural Christianity. They, they're not really walking with Jesus. They're not consistently pursuing Jesus. They, they may show up at Easter and Christmas. Uh, you know, they, they, they don't read their Bible. They don't really talk to God, maybe. And what it is, is this cultural Christianity, and the reason why is because they live in a culture like ours, where they're not a Muslim, they're not a Buddhist, they're not any of those other things, they're, they're a Christian because, well, they grew up in Cayman, and they, they went to church when, when they were a kid, and they were baptized as a kid, or whatever the case is, but they're not pursuing Jesus consistently. Those two things are completely different. And... While it seems extreme, and it's not necessarily in 100% of cases, but, but in most cases, if you meet someone and you're into them and you're into some intimate conversation and you're, you're talking about life and you're talking about things and you're getting to know them and you don't hear about Jesus within the first hour or so, you don't hear about their faith or their ministry or what God is doing in their life or, or, or any mention of that, I'm going to suggest to you that that's a red flag. I'm going to suggest to you that within the first hour, if you don't hear something from someone, again, it's not 100%, but, but, but in most cases, if you don't hear someone talk about their faith in God or, or their love for Jesus or what God is doing through them and how he's using him in about the first hour, that that's a red flag. And while that may seem extreme, it's because, well, it is. <laughs> it is extreme. But here's why I want you to remember this. Here's a good reason why I want you to remember this. That people talk about first what they value most. People talk about first what they value the most. And so you meet someone, and all of a sudden you meet them, and you're talking to them, and all of a sudden they start talking about their career and, and all the things they want to do and all the things they want to accomplish in their career and where they want to go and how they want things to work out and plan out. If they're really into cars, they start talking about cars. Have you seen my car? I mean, look at my, look at my car. I said, yeah, man, I did, I did all this stuff. Look at all this money that I spent on my car, and you like my car, and, and I like to travel, and you check out their Instagram, and it's all the places that they've been all over the world and, and all the places they love to go and all the places they still want to go. If they, They're really into shoes. You know, have you seen my shoes? I like my shoes. I really love my shoes. My kicks are really nice, right? I, you know, their dreams, their hobbies, those things, they, they're just spewing it all out. They're talking about it. As a matter of fact, here's a big red flag for you. If they start talking about their ex, red flag going up. If you have to ask them, what are your spiritual beliefs? Are you a Christian? Do you, do you go to church anywhere? Do you, what do you believe about God? After having an extended conversation, I don't mean like in the first 30 seconds. I mean, you've been talking for a little while and you haven't heard anything about any of that. I'm going to suggest to you that it's not likely that they're a committed follower of Jesus. Because 
what happens when we are a committed follower of Jesus is, is that we have a tendency to talk about how important God is to us and how important Jesus is to us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul is talking to the, the, the Corinthian church, and he actually says something to them in verse 14 and 15. He says this, he says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? Or, or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? And, and, and when you read this, it can really look like the Bible is trying to pick apart the unbelievers and just be like, like, if they're not a believer, they're useless and nobody, God doesn't care about them. That's not what it's trying to say. It's not trying to be critical of unbelievers. It's not trying to, to, sit or, to set Christians up to be judgmental of unbelievers. But what it is, is doing is, is that it is pointing out some things for us to realize. You know, there are some really amazing people who are not followers of Jesus. They're just, they're just great people. As a matter of fact, I know several people who are not followers of Jesus, who some of them are even atheists, but, but they're, they're great people. I, I've known them for years. We can sit down and have a good laugh, a good conversation, and, and there's, there's nothing wrong with that. But what it's saying here is something different. What it's saying here is it's saying that there is a difference in your spiritual foundation. And it is incredibly difficult to build a rich, spiritual, God-honoring life when there is a difference in spiritual values. When you have a difference in those spiritual values, it creates an incredible, difficult uh, sometimes it even seems in some cases like it's insurmountable to pass. And this is important for us to recognize. Because what will happen is we'll go over and say, oh, but I love him so much. He's so cute. He's so handsome. For us, we'll, we'll be like, mm, she's so fine and so fun. And I just, I just love spending time with her and, and, and being around her. And, oh, God is just limiting my options. Why, why, does, why is God limiting my options? You know, I, just, I can't find a good godly person, so I'll just find myself a person. And can I tell you that God is not limiting you. God's loving you. And God is protecting you. And he wants you to share your most treasured gift with someone else who believes that Jesus is their most treasured gift. And this is important for us who are committed to following Jesus. I want you to see what Amos 3.3 says. It says, can two walk together unless they are agreed? Like, how can you and I walk together if, if, if we don't agree? And, and, and let me use this as an example. Can two drive together? Unless they are agreed, you know that this doesn't work if you're married. Why? Because if you're driving and you're going down the road and you think that you should go a particular way, but your spouse thinks you should go a different way, you can't go together because you ain't agreed. And you nearly will get yourself in an accident arguing about which way is the best way to drive. Which way should we go? Well, why are you going this way? Why are you parking there? Why, why, why are you taking this road? Why you didn't go the other way? And now all of a sudden you are in a conflict. Well, if that's just driving, how much more important do you think it is when it comes to your life? And this is what happens for so many of us is, is that we have to realize that, that what the, when the Bible talks about this, what God intends for us is for us to move in the same direction and build together. But how can you do that if you are building on an unequal foundation? Where, where, where one of you believes one way, the other believes the other way. How do you do that? How do you build a strong foundation if it's going to be unequal? And I promise you that what you believe spiritually will impact Every area of your life, not just your relationships, every area of your life. It will impact you at work. 
It will impact you in your marriage, in your relationships. It will impact you with your family, with your parenting. It impacts every facet and area of your life. Why? Because spiritual life isn't just about showing up to church. And if it is just about showing up to church, then I think you should ask yourself the question, am I a committed follower of Jesus pursuing him with all my heart? Because this isn't what it's all about. This is, this is a pit stop in your journey of faith. This is, this is us gathering together for a family gathering. This is the, the family cookout. There's just, you know, we didn't have food this morning. Sorry. It, it, it's intended to be where we come, we get encouraged, we, we get refueled, we get fired up, and then we, we go and we finish living out our faith for the rest of the week with our family, with our friends, with our coworkers, where, wherever it is we go and wherever it is we do. Your spiritual life should impact every facet and area of your life. And more than anything else, your spiritual life will determine what your values are. More than, any, more than anything else, your spiritual beliefs will determine what your values are in life. Why? Because it will affect how you parent. But how should we raise the kids? What, 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 not, not just what will we raise the kids believing, but, but how will we raise them? How will we discipline them? What, what, what do we believe about money? Do we believe we should be generous? Do we believe we should, we should reserve our money a little bit more? It, it will affect how you see debt. I don't want to go into debt at all. Or, hey, a little bit of debt is okay. Or, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm cool with just going into to millions of dollars of debt. It will affect the things that matter in your life, the things that you care about, you will realize that you care about different things. Of course, different people care about different things. But your spiritual values will often determine the way that you view that. Does giving matter? Does going to church matter? Does being a part of a life group matter? Does, does it matter if I serve who your friends are? Your spiritual life determines a lot about who your friends are. It determines... We're going to go to parties or we're not going to go to parties or what kind of parties we're going to go to. Or if we go to parties, what are we going to do while we're at those parties? It, it, it determines so much about us. How are we going to treat people? How do we view people? Is divorce an option or is it not? How are we going to handle temptation? What are we going to, what are we going to stand for? What is our God-given purpose? Your spiritual beliefs impact all of these facets of your life, not just some. And to think that we could date someone and potentially marry someone without having those conversations and talking about those things and thinking about those things is going to set us up in a bad place. It's going to set us up in a bad place. If you have a different spiritual foundation, it will be difficult to walk together. And I don't mean this in a critical way. I mean this in a sincere way. Why? Because I pray for you that you would have not just the best marriage, but, but the best relationships possible. That's, that's my prayer for you. Is it, is it all of your life that you would be able to honor Jesus and walk with Jesus and be faithful to Jesus in every area and facet of your life? Because this is God's plan for us. But, and I don't mean what I'm about to say in a critical way, but in a sincere way, is that if he or she is not passionate about God, it'll be harder for them to love you the way God intended. If he or she is not passionate about God, it will be harder for them to love you the way that God intended. Why? Because it is God who moves our heart. And if you know anything about relationships, not just marriage, relationships, is that sometimes you can be so stubborn about what you think is right and how you think it should go and how you think it should happen. And then all of a sudden God speaks to your heart and you're like, really, God, could you not have just stayed silent on this one? Why am I the one that has to forgive first? Why am I the one that has to approach them first? Why am I the one that has to go out of my way and be the bigger person? Come on! That's not just marriage. But when you live with the person, it's kind of hard to get away from them. 
And what God wants is to move on our heart. As a matter of fact, my, my daughter is, is quite young, and, and she's kind of at this weird stage where, like, she knows about what relationships are, but she also knows that she's too young to have one. And so we're having, like, these weird conversations. I mean, she, again, she's seven, right? And, and so she's like, Daddy, when I get married, and I'm like, Oops, pump the brakes. This is a conversation we need to revisit in a few years. You're seven. And, and, and we'll be having these conversations, and, and as we're talking, and, 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 I, and I'll oftentimes say to her, I'll say, sweetheart, you don't need to give your heart to anybody. You don't need to be worrying about that right now. And just the other day we were talking about this, and, and I said this to her. I said, I said, sweetheart, whoever you marry, don't give them your heart if God doesn't have theirs. Don't give them your heart if God doesn't have theirs. And, 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 and that's my honest recommendation to you. Don't give your heart. If you're a believer, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're committed to him, you love him, don't give your heart to someone who God doesn't have their heart. Because even when you read scripture, like brothers, let me just, let me just encourage you. Like you read 1 Peter. Peter tells us that, that, that if we don't love and honor and cherish the woman that God has given to us, if, if we don't love her the way God intends, that it will literally hinder your prayers, that your prayers will be cut off. Why? Because he who finds a wife finds a good thing, but we forgot the rest of that verse, and he obtains favor from the Lord. You can't obtain favor if you're not treating his daughter the way she's supposed to be treated. For some of us, we wonder why our lives are falling apart. It's because we have lost the favor of God in our life because we're not treating the women in our lives the way that God intends for us to do so. I'm just, I, I'm going to encourage you with this because it's important that we understand that what we need is for God to transform our hearts so that we can love those people better. Whether it's our kids, whether it's the, the person we hope to marry, whether it's the person that we are married to, this is what all of us really need. It's to give our heart to God. I'm a better husband because of my love for God. I'm a better father. I almost had a better wife. I'm a better father because of my love for God, because he holds my heart. And because of that, do I get it right 100% of the time? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Even in just the last couple of days, I haven't gotten it right. I can think of several things over just the last week that I have done that I know I didn't get it right. But I know that because of my love for God and his love for me, that, that, that what I'm trying to do is build a better life. And, and don't compromise and try to build a life with someone who has a different worldview than you. It will make things incredibly difficult because what you believe about God what you believe about scripture, what you believe about eternity matters more than you could possibly imagine. So five signs you're dating the wrong person. The first one is that when they are not consistently pursuing Jesus. But the second one is when those you love don't love who you're dating. <laughs> oh, I love the, the grunts around the room. Mm, mm, mm. I told you this message was going to be tough. I warned you. Welcome to church this morning. This could be an incredible warning sign for you. And I'll be honest with you, pay attention to this. Pay attention to this. When you have a strong, now listen to this part. When you have a strong community around you, Meaning that the people who are around you, you have a strong sense of community with one another. You have a strong sense of family and love and care and concern, especially if they are spiritually grounded people. Especially if they are spiritually grounded people in the Lord. And they don't like the person you're dating, that can be a warning sign. A huge one. Because when the people you trust the most... Not the people you feel like you're stuck with. The people you trust the most 
don't like the person you're dating, it doesn't feel good either to you or to them. And this can be a huge warning sign. And, we, and I'll be honest with you, I see this all the time in marriage counseling, in premarital counseling, in just relationship counseling. When the people you love the most don't feel good about the person you're dating, that's a huge warning sign. And we see it all the time. You meet someone and like, oh, they're cute and we have so much fun together. And, you know, when I'm around them, I feel all the tinglys on the inside. And it's just so fantastic and so wonderful. And then you fall hard and, and then you meet them. And then your best friend comes along and meets them. And they're like, mm, I'm not so sure. And then your other best friend comes along and they meet them. And they're like, mm, I, don't, I don't know. I don't think so. I don't, I, I'm not so sure. I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't think so. I don't think this is the one. And then they meet your mom. <laughs> I don't think this is the one. Boy, I heard that lady. I don't think this is the one. And then they meet your dad. I don't think this is the one. And then they meet your sister. And then they meet your brother. And they don't like them either. And then they meet your dog who likes everybody, but for some reason your dog doesn't like them. It's a warning sign. Pay attention. It's, it's, it's real. Listen to what Proverbs tells us. Proverbs 27 verse 9, it says, The heartfelt counsel of a friend is as sweet as perfume and incense. So what it's saying is, is that what we have to realize, there's another verse that says better are the kisses, uh, the, the, the wounds of a friend than the kisses of an enemy. Because what it means is that, is that sometimes our counsel needs to counsel us about some difficult stuff. We need people in our lives who are going to tell us the difficult thing, not just simply pat us on the back and go, it's okay. We need people who, who will surround us and they will tell us the truth. Now, don't get me wrong. There's telling the truth and then there's telling the truth. You know what I mean? Like you got some people that they'll just look at you and they'll walk right up to you and they'll be like, well, you fat. Hello would have been nice first. You know what I mean? There's, there's telling the truth and there's telling the truth. It's not that we are purpose is seeking to wound people, but, but that we try as much as possible to have heartfelt counsel where we say, listen, I've got some concerns about some of the things I see in your life. I love you. I care about you. I want what's best for you. And I'm just not sure that this is it. I, I, I'm, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to walk with you through this, but, but pay attention, please. Because some of the things that I'm seeing I have concerns about. And when you've got people in your life who say, pay attention, that's important for you to do. Why? Because they may be seeing things that you're not. They may be seeing things that you're not. As a matter of fact, one of the things that I have learned is that it's not always easy to come out and tell someone things that you know. Why? Because people don't always want to believe you. That you might be telling them the truth. And because they don't want to believe you, and so what has happened in some cases, I've seen where someone will come along and say, "Not here's what I know. They will come along and they will say, I've seen some things that concern me, and I think you should pay attention. Your, your antenna should be up. You should begin to pay attention at that point. Because they are cluing you in, maybe the things that they know, but if they told you, it would wreck you and break you. And they want you to understand that they're still looking out for you, but they also don't want to drive a wedge between you and them because they care about you more than that. Friends and family, they love you, especially, like I said, if they're spiritually grounded, they have your best interest at heart. Be open to what they see. And what they say, because they may see something you don't. They may see that he's not honoring you the way that he's supposed to. They may see that she's too into herself, and you don't. 
They, they may see that, that he's pushing you sexually to do things that, that you know are not honoring to God. They may see that, that she's way too controlling over your life and what you do and where you go and what you say and how you live. They may see those things and you may not, oh, but that, that, you just don't understand them. Pay attention. Pay attention. Because what will happen for you is that you are going to want all of those people to be wrong. Listen, I've been there. A hundred times I've been there. Where I've been told, Andrew, pay attention. Look out. From friends, from family, from people that love me and care about me. Pay attention. And, I, and I'm over there and I'm just like, yeah, man, I'm paying attention. To how beautiful she is. I'm paying attention, all right. I don't, have a, yeah. you just don't understand. Like the way that that my game is set up, like I'm going to take care of that. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. It don't work that way. It doesn't work that way. You will have a tendency to want to believe the best about Remember, You know that song that came out years ago, Love is Blind? Because I wouldn't even say so much that love is blind. I would just say that what happens is, is that we allow ourselves to become blinded and we want to not believe those things about people. And then we get ourselves in trouble. And then if you've ever been in this situation, you know how, how incredibly difficult it is. Something may come out, you discover something, something happens, and then you realize, I didn't know them as well as I thought I did. And then you end up saying a phrase, something along the lines like, my, my mom was right about you. <laughs> my friends were right about you. Pay attention. Because God has put people in our lives to give us counsel for this reason, to help us make wise choices. Why? Because the wise see trouble and they walk away from it. They don't run to it. Proverbs twelve fifteen says, the way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. If you've ever been in that place where you felt like a fool for something, like, like everybody warned you about it before. Like, pay attention, look out for this, pay attention to that. And you're like, you're like yeah, man, yeah, man, no problem, no problem. And you, you know you're just kind of ignoring it, and you keep going that way, and then all of a sudden, you feel like a fool afterwards because you go, why didn't I listen to them? Why didn't I listen to the advice that everyone was giving me? Is because when we live as the unwise do, we just we ignore all the red flags around us and we just walk right into trouble. That's not what God intends for us. So, first of all, they're not consistently pursuing Jesus. Second of all, that those that you love don't love them. And third of all, when you don't experience healthy conflict. When you don't experience healthy conflict. Now, let me say this. I'm not saying you won't fight. It's not a matter of if you're going to fight. It's a matter of when you're going to fight. Because everybody fights. Every couple fights. As a matter of fact, it's always funny when I get couples that come into me and they say, we never fight. The first thing I try to do in premarital counseling is make them fight. Just being honest with you. Because everybody fights. You're going to have disagreements. You're going to have arguments. There's, there's going to be things that you, you disagree on. It's not if you fight, though. And it's not even when you fight. It's how you fight that makes the difference. This is the critical thing. This is what is important. Why? Because healthy couples fight fair. Unhealthy couples fight to win. Unhealthy couples fight to win. So, so I, I'm going to fight dirty. I'm going to say whatever I got to say because I'm going to hurt your feelings and I'm going to win this fight. That is unhealthy. Healthy couples work towards resolution. Unhealthy couples press for victory. I, I have to be but we're not going to say, I, I, I got, I, I've got to have victory. We'll say, no, no, I'm right in this, so I'm going to stand my ground. And what ends up happening is, is that we bulldoze over people because we're right. And what we don't realize is there's a trail of bodies left behind us 
from us being right. Healthy couples fight fear and they work on resolutions. You know, just, just the other day, Emily and I, uh, we had a fight. And she came crawling over to me on her hands and her knees. And she said to me, get out from under that bed, you coward, and fight like a man. <laughs> I could see her face on the front. She's like, say what? What, 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 what is this boy talking about? <laughs> but the reality is, right, is for a lot of us, we, we're like, when we're married, we fight about dumb stuff. Like we're, we're driving in the car. Again, we're fighting about what route we're taking. Like why did you go this way? Especially for me, like especially if we're going somewhere that we've never been before. And, 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 like, and, and we're trying to figure out how to get there and where we're going. Like I get so frustrated. I, I mean, I am just on edge. And she's like, she's like, babe, you don't think you should? Just, just, just let me figure it out. But what Emily and I have had to learn to do is to work on our relationship in non-conflict times. What I mean by that is, is that when we're not in conflict, we, we work to strengthen the relationship as opposed to waiting till we're in the middle of a conflict to then try and work things out. Because when we're in the middle of it, sometimes we're heated. And what happens is then what we're doing is, is we're feeling heated. We've got all these emotions going on and we're frustrated and then we're trying to solve problems in the middle of that. You know, like for instance, I like to be early to most things that I'm going to. I like to be either on time or early, whereas Emily is a little bit more creative in her expression of arrival. And so she and I, we may have conflict in that. And so here's what we've done to resolve that. In a lot of cases, we will drive separately. That takes the issues away. We, we've had to learn to come up with solutions for problems that we foresee are going to happen. And this is just some of the things that we, we've learned to do. We've learned to work through the issues, even the small issues, because no matter how much people tell you that the small issues don't matter, the small issues matter. Because an accumulation of small issues can be a big issue. You know, you ever realize that, that when you go to the store and you buy toilet paper, that on every roll of toilet paper, that they're all in just these little squares. But if you take enough of those little squares and you put enough of them together and you bunch them up and you put them in the toilet, you know you're going to have a club, right? So enough accumulation of the small things can become big things. So working on the small stuff, just be, oh, that's a small issue, don't worry about it. No, work it out, resolve it, talk through it, work on them. The Bible says that we should not go to bed angry, that we shouldn't let the sun go down on our wrath. And I'll be honest with you, there's some weeks where we didn't sleep until Thursday because we were up dealing with the issues, but we make sure that we handle them. We talk about them. We, we work through it, and we have had to learn to fight fear because I'll be honest with you, we didn't always know how to do that. And we're still learning to this day how to fight fear in our relationship. As a matter of fact, when we have disagreements, I have a tendency to elevate the argument. And so it'll just be something small, it'll seem not that big of a deal, and I have a tendency to elevate, whereas Emily has more of a tendency to stay calm when we're having issues. Me? Pedal to the metal, let's go! Emily's like, pump the brakes a little bit. We need to stay calm here. Emily, though, tends to retreat when we have disagreements, but, but, but I have a tendency to give the cold shoulder. So I'm frustrated about something, and, 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 and she doesn't necessarily want to have the big fight about it. And then me, on the other hand, I'm just like, well, well, whatever. Mm -hmm. What do you want for dinner? Yeah, fine. And I go in the kitchen. Baby, whatever. Hmm? I have a tendency to do that. And then she picks up on, uh, 
What's wrong with you? Nothing. And here's the problem. We're both stubborn. We are both very stubborn people. And that is a recipe for big arguments. And over the years, we've had to learn how to navigate through all those things. Because if we don't, it will create bigger issues than are necessary. We've had to learn to be accountable to each other and say, you know what, we're going to keep working on this for it to be better. We've got to learn to fight fear. Now, there's two extremes in this that I want to point out to you. Two extremes are this. The first one is that you always fight. We're always fighting. We're fighting, 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 fighting. We make up. We break up. We make back up. That's a red flag. If you broke up eight times this week, that is a red flag. If every time something goes wrong, you're walking out the door, that is a red flag. And don't think, well, if we get married, that'll make everything better. Because you know what that is the equivalent of for married people? If we just have a baby, that'll make everything better. It doesn't make everything better. It doesn't make everything better. And so if you're always fighting, you're always going at each other, that's a red flag. And if the second one, the second extreme is that if you never fight, that's a problem. Because what happens in most cases where people are never fighting is what's happening is we're just kind of sweeping it all under the rug. We never talk about it. We never deal with anything. And before you know it, nobody can walk on the rug because there's just a mountain of stuff that's underneath it. And everybody's afraid to lift it up and take a peek and see what's there. Because if we open it up, the floodgates will open and everything will come rushing out. So we just leave it alone. We don't talk about it. We just do our separate stuff. Those two extremes, neither of them are good. They are both red flags. What you want to have is a reasonable amount of conflict and the maturity and spiritual maturity to love each other well through conflict to move the relationship forward. That's what you want. So when you begin to work on those things, you know, we talk a lot about communication, but, but the reality is, is that it isn't just communication. A part of communication is problem solving. And when you learn that, and, and brothers, what I don't mean by that is that you have all the answers, because I know us. We'll be like, well, if you just did this, that usually elevates the argument. It's about learning how to navigate with each other. James says it this way. It's one of my best scriptures that I love to read when it comes to conflict resolution. James chapter 1, 19 to 20 says, everyone should be quick to listen. Say quick to listen. Say slow to speak. And say, slow to become angry. That is what God wants for us to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. So you're there and you're trying to argue and fight it out. And And what he's saying is this isn't going to produce what God wants in you. It's not going to produce in your relationship, in your marriage, in in, in any relationship whatsoever. Because I'll be honest with you, anger has always been one of my big things. As I kind of hit my teenage years and life kind of happened to me, I've always struggled with anger, even to this day. Anger is something I must pay very close attention to personally in my life because I have a ten. I'm, I'm like a fuse. You light me and I go. And what has happened is, is that God has had to temper this in me and use this in a different way in me. And and over the years, I have seen tremendous progress in relation to to my anger. But I realized that, that, that anger does not produce what God wants it to produce in me. Because when I'm angry, I say dumb things. When I'm angry, I make dumb decisions. When I'm angry, I do all kinds of stuff that I would not typically and normally do, but for some reason, I'm angry now, and I'm going to do something I shouldn't do. For you and for me, we must be careful of this. 
So first one is not pursuing Jesus. The second one is that those you love don't love them. The third one is that you don't have healthy conflict. And fourthly, when you find it difficult to trust the one you're with. This is a huge red flag. If you're having trouble trusting the person you're with, this is a huge red flag. I want to give you a scripture for this. 1 Corinthians 13, 7. This is like the big love chapter in the Bible. Everybody loves reading this at weddings and, and everywhere else, right? Look at what it says about love. It says that love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. I want to emphasize the trust there, but I mean all this is important, but, but I want to emphasize the trust there is that love always trusts. If you do not have trust, you do not have love. If you do not have trust that what you have, it is going to be difficult to have a healthy relationship without trust. Now, don't get me wrong. That doesn't mean you won't have moments of insecurity. Moments of insecurity are natural for all of us. I'll be honest with you. I had a moment of insecurity this morning. I looked at my wife's phone, and I realized that her phone said fun time on it. And I went, who's calling my wife, and their name is fun time? And then I realized it says FaceTime. I went, oh, FaceTime. Oh, woo, woo. Thank you, Jesus. I feel the anointing, Lord. I looked at my wife. I'm like, I'm like, Emily, who is calling you? Do you have them saved in your phone as fun time? I was panicking, insecure. And I went, thank you, Jesus, that I read that properly because I was standing there freaking out for a second. We will all have moments of insecurity, every single one of us. That's, that's normal. That's natural. But, I, but when you are consistently worried that you can't trust somebody, that's a red flag. When you live in this constant state of worry of can I trust them, it is a huge red flag. And let me, let me unpack this for you a little bit so we can understand this a little bit better. If you don't trust them, in some cases, it's because you can't trust them. You know, we got our saying, I don't trust them as far as I can throw them. I started saying, I don't trust them as far as I can see them with my glasses off because if I take my glasses off, I can't see far at all. It's like right here. So, so for some of us, it's like you can't trust them because you can't trust them. But what are the reasons why? Well, some good reasons is because they're always sliding up in somebody else's DMs. She's always snapping old pics with boyfriends, old boyfriends. He's liking every girl in a bikini's picture on Instagram. And they're always eyeing someone. You're out at a restaurant. What are you looking at? You obviously see a different menu than the one that is here. But let me say this to you gently as well. Maybe the reason you can't trust them could be that you are the problem. Maybe it's because you are overly possessive. Maybe it's because you are insecure. Maybe it's not so much that they are not trustworthy, but it's that you are not trusting. In which case, that too is a red flag. And this is important for us to understand is because what can happen in this situation is we point our finger at everyone except ourselves, and then we get into multiple relationships with some really great people. But what happens is, is because we never dealt with our own insecurities and, and the way that we have felt, because you, you will hop from relationship to relationship and you will carry that in every relationship with you. And I, like I said, I, I want to say that as gently as I possibly can. So if you find yourself always wondering, what's he looking at on his phone? If you find yourself wondering, where is she? Why didn't they call? Pay attention. Because that says a lot about your relationship. That says a lot about, about you. They could be an amazing person. But if you don't trust them, it will be difficult to love them. You may, and you may genuinely feel like you love them, but 
you just don't trust them. And if that is the case, if that's where you find yourself, let me ask you a very important question. Why would you stay with someone you don't trust? Why would you? Why would you stay with someone you don't trust? It's important for us to realize how much of a red flag that is. It will not, marriage won't fix that. Can I tell you something? Marriage doesn't fix problems. Marriage doesn't fix problems. It never has and it never will. The problems you had before will still be the problems you have after. You know, I used to say as a, as, a, 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 as a young man, I would say, oh, I can't wait to get married because, man, I just struggle with lust so much. And once I get married, I'll be good. And, I, and I, I remember just saying to Emily very early on in our marriage one time, I was, I was like, I really need you to pray for me because I'm struggling with lust. And she's like, what do you mean? And we had to talk through that and talk about that. And I just said, I, for some reason, I just, I'm finding myself being tempted towards lusting things. I haven't done anything. I haven't, like, I haven't acted on anything. I haven't lashed out or whatever. Like, I just, I find myself struggling with lust. The best person for me to tell that to is not my friend who's going to be like, well, was she cute? Best person to tell that to is my wife who I know will pray for me because she's the one that my heart needs to pursue. Not something or someone else. And she prayed with me. And you know what? That was very re- relatively early on in our marriage. She prayed for me, and I haven't struggled with it since, literally. Like, God just broke that off of me. It, it, it was no longer a, a, an issue for me, and God just began to move through that in our relationship and in our marriage. And you know who God used for that? The person who should have been the most offended at it. And to this day, she still trusts me. Why? Because I was honest. Again, it wasn't that I had gone out and done anything, but what happens is that some of us so often feel insecure about things, and we suffer with our insecurity in silence, and that's where insecurity grows. Insecurity grows when we ignore it, but when we begin to talk about it, when we begin to, to, to move through and don't get me wrong, there's not everybody that can handle your insecurity. Not everyone will be as kind as Emily was in that situation. Not everyone will, will, will work with you through that the way that other people have. Sometimes you, you, you really need to seek help for that. And then number five, when they're leading you away from Jesus instead of closer to Jesus, that is a huge red flag. The question I think you need to ask is, Are we growing closer to Jesus together, or are we drifting further apart? This is a good question to ask whether you're one month, two months, three months, 12 months into a relationship. Are we growing closer to Jesus together, or aren't we? I want to show you what Jesus had to say. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 4, he said, see that no one leads you astray. No one. See that no one leads you astray. So what does, that, what does this look like? What do these red flags look like? Well, you start dating and you stop going to church. You start dating and you start drifting from Christian community that surrounds you. You start dating and you, you start to be compromised sexually over and over and over again. And you wake up one day and you realize... They were rationalizing sin together. Oh, it's okay. God will forgive us. It's okay. You know, there's, there's grace and forgiveness for it. Those are all red flags. And like I said this morning, I realized that for some of us, we hear this message and we go, man, this is a really extreme sermon. This is really extreme. And, the, and this seems extreme for a lot of people. But we need to remember that in Scripture, that God's gift of sexual intimacy was reserved for the covenant of marriage. And that doesn't mean that you won't be tempted. That doesn't mean that you won't be tempted. We we, we will all be tempted. 
You're going to start dating someone and you're attracted to them. And all of a sudden, you start feeling all these wonderful things and you begin to, to, to get the tinglys happening. And you just want to grab them, you want to squeeze them, you want to hold them. You, you, you will be tempted. You will be tempted in all of these different ways. And if you're never tempted, that's a different sermon. But Proverbs 5, if you go and you read it, Proverbs 5 actually tells us that sex is intoxicating. Go, go and read it yourself. Sex is intoxicating. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand in church, but, but if you've ever been drunk before, you know what that's like. Right? Where, where you get better looking, and so does everybody else. And you're standing there, and you're, you're looking in the mirror at yourself, and you're like, hey, good looking. <laughs> yeah. They call them the drunk goggles. The bear goggles. And what it does is that it blurs your vision, it lowers your standards, and it clouds your judgment. And that's exactly what happens when you introduce sex into a relationship. Is it does the exact same thing. And, and so this is why God reserved it for marriage. Why well, God said that this is, this is a, a gift that I want you to have, but I'm, I'm, I'm reserving it for the covenant of marriage. Because God wants us to be, and the Bible tells us this over and over again, sober-minded. That we can be like the sensible. I want us to, I want us to look at this again re really quickly. This, the, 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 the sensible they see trouble coming and they avoid it. The unthinking, they walk into trouble and they regret it later. And, and so many of us have been in this position before where, where, where we have experienced this exact same thing. We've, we've made decisions and we look back at it and we be like, oh, I regret that so much. Why did I do that? Oh, if I, if I, if I was seeing things clearly, I wouldn't have made that decision. I wouldn't have done that thing, and you sober up, and you realize, oh my gosh, what did I just do? You realize you're not following Jesus, and that they're not following Jesus. You realize that, that those you love, that they didn't love them. You realize that, that, that you don't have healthy conflict. You realize that you didn't trust them. They didn't trust you. You realize that you're walking away from Jesus. And for some of us, what we need to do, I said this earlier, and again, I know this might seem a bit extreme, but I say this with a heart of love and compassion towards you, is that what some of us need to do in the relationships we're in right now is just break up. Because you can't marry the right person if you're dating the wrong one. Psalm 119, verse 115 says this. It says, get out of my life, for I intend to obey the commands of my God. Now, that would be a harsh breakup message. Let me, just, let me just preface that, right? You know, get out of my life. I'm, I'm, I'm going to obey God. But the premise behind it is the important part, is, is that we understand that, that, that what we want is to pursue God. And in pursuing God, that changes everything. And can I just, can I just say something? I know this can be difficult for some of us. We hear this and we go, but, but what if I don't get anybody else? And part of the problem some of us are facing right now in our single lives is that we're not trusting God when it comes to our relationships. We think we are. But for so many of us, we're not. But God, if I walk away from this, I'm not going to have anybody. God, if I walk away from this, what am I going to do next? Who am I, who am I going to be with? Who, what's what's going to happen? And, and what has happened for so many of us is that we are afraid to take a step forward because we feel like, I'm going to be alone for the rest of my life and nobody's going to ever love me or care about me. And that's not true. That's a lie that the enemy tells you to convince you to keep going in a direction that you know God isn't leading you. And so for you today, maybe what you need to do is say, I intend to obey the commands of my God. And because I'm going to obey, and this isn't just if you're single, this is if you're married too. 
that I'm going to obey God and what he said, and I'm going to follow him, and I'm going to serve him, and I'm going to live for him, and I'm going to pursue him. I want to invite the, the team to come back up. We're going to close here in just a second with a song. But I know some of us, as we listen to this, we, we go, well, Pastor, why are you being so serious about all this stuff? And it's easy to ignore some of these things. But you know, what I cannot ignore is the pain and the suffering that I see so many people go through when relationships don't work out. Because we've been fed so much bad information. Because so much has been told to us. But I want to give you the, the flip side. And the flip side is the green flags that you're dating and you're pursuing Jesus together, that those you love, that they love them too, that you have healthy conflict together, that you're growing in trust, that you're both growing closer and closer to Jesus. And the reason why this is important is because everything in your life flows out of these things. The relationships you have with other people are influenced by these things. And I want what God's best is for you today. But so many of us have been bogged down by the things that have been happening. And we, 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 we want to live a life that is Christ-centered and God-honoring. And that's my prayer for you today, regardless of where you find yourself. Whether you're single, whether you're married, whether, whether you're divorced, whether you are a widow, what, wherever you find yourself. That you understand that, that God loves you. And he loves you so much that he sent his son to die on a cross for you so that you could have eternal life in a relationship with him. And that is fundamentally the greatest news that you could ever hear or receive. And I know that many of us, we're, we're hoping and we want to see, well, you know, God, who, who's that person I'm going to be with? But, but can I tell you something? It's so important that we realize that how much pursuing Jesus changes everything about our life. Because if we believe what the Bible says about who God is, the Bible says that no good thing would he withhold from us. If it was good for you, God wouldn't have said no. If that relationship was good for you, God wouldn't have said no. And you might be saying, but, 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 but God, trust him and know that he will lead you and guide you and direct you in the right way and in the right path if you put your hope and your trust in him. Let's pray. God, right now I thank you for your word, and I just lift up every person in this room today, Father. Hearts that are heavy by, and burdened by so much, Father God. And, and Lord, today even as, as we've talked, Lord, you, you see how you're changing and shaping relationships right now. Father God, how you're speaking to people and, and, and transforming their heart and their life. And I just ask right now that, Lord, even though this has been a hard word today, that, Father, that this word would be buried deep in our heart for us to pursue you with all our hearts and lives. So Jesus, today we put our faith, our hope, and our trust in you for you to lead us and guide us, for you to direct us in relationships, for you, Father God, to, to have your way in us and through us for the glory and the honor of your name. And so right now, Lord, I just come against, Father God, every lie of the enemy that he's, he's been telling us. So many of us, Father God, how we've been, we've been fed the lie of the enemy over and over again, that we're not good enough, that we're always going to be alone, that no one loves us, that no one cares. And I rebuke that thought this morning in Jesus' name because you loved us enough to die on the cross for our sins. We are loved more than we could possibly ever understand, more than we could possibly ever fathom. And so God, today in Jesus' name, I pray you would help us to walk in your victory. And we thank you and we praise you. Listen, maybe for you, you're here today and, and you, you've heard this message. And, and I know it's a lot about relationships and all this kind of stuff. But, but the reality is, is that the greatest relationship you could ever have is with Jesus. That he's the one who wants to transform your life. To change your heart. That he's the one today that you should give your heart to and trust him with your heart. If you hide your heart in him. He won't give it away to someone who is going to destroy it. 
And if, if that's you today, as you, you want to put your faith, your hope, and your trust in him, would you just raise your hand right where you are? We want to pray with you. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else? Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Would you just pray with me right now and just repeat this prayer and say, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. And I ask you to save me. I ask you to heal me and restore me. I am yours from this day forward. Now help me to live for you every day from this day forward. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.